Frank Seppi for Muscle and Fitness, Military Month, right? Military Fitness and Wellness Month. I am here with Senior Military Editor and my good friend, Robert Wilkins. And Robert, can you introduce our fantastic guest right there? Yes, thanks. Thanks, Frank. And uh, hello, everyone. It's my honor and privilege to have our friend, uh, Dr. Dan Bornstein, with us. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Dan. Uh, Dr. Dan is the chair of the military setting sector of the U.S. National Physical Activity Plan. Hmm. Previously, he tendered, uh, he tendered at the, as the professor at the Department of Health and Human Performance and director of the Center of Performance, Readiness, Resiliency, and Recovery at the Citadel Military College of South Carolina. Hmm. Dr. Bornstein completed his, completed his PhD in exercise science from the University of South Carolina and immediately went to work publishing extensively and presenting at national and international conferences in the areas of physical activity and public health, including physical activity monitoring, physical activity communication, physical, physical activity policy, and physical activity messaging. Currently, he's leading a series of research studies investigating the impacts of physical inactivity and how physical fitness on military readiness and national security may end up impairing our national defense. His research has been featured in over 130 media outlets worldwide, including USA Today, Newsweek, Stars and Stripes, The Hill, National Public Radio, and Muscle and Fitness was honored to cover him or feature him a few weeks ago. Uh, based on his research, Dan has provided numerous briefings to senior military personnel and lawmakers, including briefings at the Pentagon and on Capitol Hill. Um, with all that, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Dan Bornstein. My Thank great you, friend. Rob. Thank you, Frank. It's, it's such a pleasure to be here and, and <clears throat> gosh, hearing all that stuff. I, you know, I, I'm just Dan. So just please just call me Dan. And I, I'm, I'm thrilled and honored to be here. Uh, muscle and fitness is 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 a brand that that's been so present in my life for a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things we were talking about, you know, before we started the show is, uh, you know, I did have a brief stint in all natural bodybuilding when I lived out in Tucson, Arizona. And so, you know, muscle and fitness has been a, a staple for me for many, many years. And uh, it's just an honor and pleasure to be here. So thank you for having me. Our pleasure. Thank Our pleasure. you. Frank. I guess you know, one of the most important questions I have is, you know, myself and Robin, our last couple of guests, we were talking about the state of mental and physical health of people who are currently in the military. Um, and, you know, how do you bring them to the next level? How do you get them in better shape? How do you get them better mentally? How do you get them better physically? Like, what would you recommend what, during your programs and such? Because it's, it's, you know, forget about the people who are trying to come, you know, to sign up or, you know, get recruited. Um, we're talking about the current people who are now, you know, in the military. Right. Mm. Great question. Um, <clears throat> complex answer. So, you know, the military is, it's a microcosm of the rest of our country. So the problems that we see with physical fitness, uh, physical health, mental health in the military is very much a mirror of what we're seeing in the rest of our society. And one of the things we know from a public health perspective and, and, and other perspectives is that ultimately we are creatures of our environment or environments. Mm -hmm. So if we surround ourselves with like-minded people, then it's much more likely that's our social environment. So our family, our friends, <clears throat> people that we may work with, we know that, that that social environment can have a real impact on an individual's knowledge and attitudes and behavior. So I'll, I'll give you a really good example. You know, I, I had sort of gotten off of my weightlifting routine a little bit uh, after a series of sort of injuries that I'd had and so on. And a couple of weeks ago, I had the pleasure of visiting a group of veterans and a big part of what they do is PT every morning at 0600. And to, to, to be in the presence of other people, uh, first of all, I'm a very social guy. So being in the presence of other people and PTing with them together it, it, with a form of PT, meaning physical training, right? In the military, not, not physical therapy, but physical training that's, that, that meets the modern science for what we know is an effective way to train 
Mm -hmm. uh, again, not just from a bodybuilding perspective, but from a functionality perspective, I had the time of my life. I mean, it just, it just totally reinvigorated me to get back into the gym and back lifting regularly. Mm -hmm. um, I got knocked out with COVID last week, but, but next week, next week, I'm going to get back <laughs> in the gym. But my point is that I was in a social environment that was really supportive of the behavior. Um, beyond that, we have something called the physical environment, right? So when we talk about physical activity, uh, do we live and work in areas where it's safe to walk and bike, for example? Mm -hmm. uh, New York City is a great example of, a, a, of an area where, you know, it's almost prohibitively expensive to own a car. So the default is I'm going to take public transportation and do I'm going to walk or bike to where I need to go. And there's, it's a much more physically active culture, much like you see in, in, in countries like the Netherlands and others where they have an entire transportation infrastructure that's designed around active living. Um, and then you get all the way up to the, to the policy environment. So what policies do we have in place that are going to encourage people to become and stay more physically active and mentally healthy? And <clears throat> So that's something in public health that we call the social ecological model. You've mm -hmm. got a policy environment that impacts a physical environment, that impacts a social environment, that impacts the individual. And what the military is doing right now is they are leading the way, as they have in many ways, the VA and the DOD both have, have been innovators historically in both clinical medicine and in public health. So right now in the VA, there's a program called Whole Health, which looks at the entire health of the individual from multiple different domains, right? Physical, mental, spiritual, and so on. And the Department of Defense similarly has come out with something called Total Force Fitness, which means looking at the health of the entire individual. And the U.S. Army in particular right now is implementing, as we speak, their version of Total Force Fitness, which is called Holistic health and fitness, which looks at different domains of readiness, sleep mm. readiness, physical readiness, uh, mental readiness, and so on. So they are creating, in essence, the policies and systems and environments. Ultimately, ultimately, it does come down to the individual soldier, airman, marine, guardian. Um, and <clears throat> so... Again, to, to answer your question, Frank, long-winded, is it's very difficult to ask somebody to improve their physical and mental health in the absence of some supportive environments. Yes. But when we're able to create some of those supportive environments, and that's what the purpose of the military settings sector is that, I, that I'm the chair of, then it becomes a much easier task on a daily basis to take up and maintain the behaviors that we know improve physical activity, physical fitness, physical health, and mental health. Hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and in a, in a recent article you wrote for The Hill, um, which was titled America's Newest National Security Threat, Obesity, you had mentioned from recruiting to readiness to retention to retirement, physical inactivity and obesity pose national security threats that the US military cannot fight alone. So for all those who are not in the military community who don't really know much about the military because it's only about 0.7% who are serving right now, uh, I'm not sure what the national statistics are of those who are connected to the military, but I think it's pretty low. Can you kind of give us an idea of how is obesity, physical inactivity, a national security threat? Yeah. Um, it's a great question. There's... The most direct, there, there's, there are several ways to answer the question. The most direct answer to the question comes down to recruiting. So this year for the first time, well, for the first time in, a, in, in many years, <clears throat> most of the branches are falling short mm -hmm. of their recruiting goals. The, the army, which is the largest branch is falling short by tens of thousands of soldiers. Mm -hmm. And they have asked Congress for a reduction in what's called end strength, meaning the total number of soldiers that they can legally have in the, in the Army. This comes as we are facing pretty real and potential near peer adversaries like China. Mm -hmm. And their armies are growing, their armies growing bigger and stronger uh, with each passing day. There are a couple of different statistics out there right now. There's one 
um, from a, an organization called Mission Readiness, which is a group of retired um, uh, military leaders. That the statistic from Mission Readiness is that roughly 77% of age eligible Americans cannot meet the basic standards for military service. I just completed a study with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which put that number at 66%. But let me let me differentiate those two numbers because the number for mission readiness includes disqualification for obesity and lack of physical fitness, but also includes disqualification for maybe having a criminal record or, may, or not having completed a high school degree. So it's a more comprehensive number, but to answer your question more directly, Rob, which was about obesity and physical activity, the research that I just completed with CDC, which looked just at BMI, body mass index, and physical activity levels, that 66% of age eligible Americans fail to meet the minimum physical fitness standards for service. So that's a pretty scary number. So when it comes to how does obesity and physical activity pose threats to our military readiness? That's the first step is recruiting. The second is I've done some research with the US Army Public Health Center where over the last several decades, they've been seeing an increase in the number of, of musculoskeletal injuries, in, abbreviated MSKIs. Mm. These are training related injuries. They're, so they're, they're stress fractures, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the hips and legs, knee injuries, ankle sprains, low back injuries. These injuries didn't used to happen with any high frequency 30, 40, 50 years ago. But there's been a tr pretty dramatic rise in the increase of these musculoskeletal injuries, not only in basic training, but over the course of a service member's career to the point now where MSKIs are the number one reason for medical lack of readiness. So the inability to deploy, forward deploy for some kind of military conflict, the number one medical reason is an MSKI. Wow. And then we carry that forward to our veteran population. Rob, you know our, our good friend Reagan Stigman very well. Yes. Uh, retired Air Force Colonel, um, uh, uh, osteopathic doctor, and Reagan who stated the fact, and it is a fact, that among our service members, we're taking the fittest segment of our population mm -hmm. and literally turning them into the sickest members of our population. So this challenge of, of physical activity and obesity starts basically pre-K through 12 schools, ensuring that we've got youth who are involved in, 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 in youth sport and have access, as we talked earlier about having a social environment, a physical environment, that allows them access to regular physical activity and healthy options is critical for recruiting to try to prevent them from getting injured for, from preventable injuries. These, these MSKIs that then end up plaguing them over the course of, and maybe perhaps even shortening their military career and then becoming veterans who are among the least healthy members of our population. So that's how it affects from, from pre-accession or pre-military pre all the way through to veteran status. And as I said earlier, it's really just a microcosm of what's happening in our culture. Right. I saw this uh, article once and it talked about playtime, how playtime is important for national security, because you learn to run, you learn to jump, you learn to roll in the mud and climb trees, all these skills, which mm -hmm. translate into the military later on. Most people, you know, at my age, we were learning at four, five, six, seven years old. Well, now, you know, our American youth for the most part, aren't doing those activities. So by the time they become 16, 17, 18, you know, if they have not been physically active and they do try to join the military, you know, they could have 100% uh, scores for their academic portion, but they fail the physical component, which I almost feel, how is that even possible? How is that possible? But it's happening so frequently that it is a national issue that what you have said, Dan, it becomes an executive issue where we need to get our legislatures involved in this to come up with some solutions, because if we keep going down the same path, it's only going to get worse. It's funny. I ran into uh, a couple of people at the gym who are younger kids who wanted to join the military, mm -hmm. but they're like, we'll never be in shape. They're like, we don't like to run. We don't like to do this. So you're pulling for candidates for such a minute pool of people. 
if you look at the police department, the fire department in New York back in the day, and I know you, I know, you know this, Dan, when people got ready for this fireman test, it was a big deal. Like, you know, they, they trained for four or five months and the majority of them didn't make it, you know, pulling a dummy, going up the stairs. Is there a program of of some sort, maybe nationally at, at a gym chain or something that where you can kind of do like a, uh, you know, pre-military workout to get in shape? I know there's boot camp, but so many people have no idea what to do. And like you said before, Dan, if you surround yourself with like-minded people, you're going to succeed. But if you're going to train for the military as a bodybuilder or an MMA fighter, it's not going to be the same as if you do specific movements and stuff for performance and and. So, it's tailor made for the military. So what do you think? Is there, is there an initiative for that? It, it's a great, it's a great question, Frank. And, and I want to just circle back very quickly what Rob was talking about earlier, which is just basic movement skill and yeah. gross motor patterns. And, and it was best summed up by a friend of mine, a Colonel in the army who basically said, you know, if you can't throw a ball, how are you going to throw a grenade? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's like, yeah, that makes sense. You know, I look at some of these kids throwing balls nowadays and I'm like, ah, I, I, wherever they're going to throw that grenade, I don't want to be anywhere near it. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> so forgive me. Um, in turn, Rob, um, uh, Frank, in terms of like published commercially available uh, uh, workout programs, right? W one, one that's been around for a long time is, is the pre-buds uh, workout program. So Buds is is the um, the the school that that's the the this uh, the stepping stone for Navy SEAL training. Mm -hmm. So there are there are a number of programs out there and, and how to get ready for it's they're called pre Buds workouts. Um, there's also there is a book out from the National Strength and Conditioning Association now on how to prepare for what's called the Army Combat Fitness Test. So the the Army just made a a very significant transition uh, away from what was called the Army Physical Fitness Test, or APFT, which consisted of three elements. It was basically a, a two-mile timed run, and then push-ups and sit-ups. Mm -hmm. And they've now transitioned to something called the ACFT, or Army Combat Fitness Test, which is a much more comprehensive assessment of physical fitness to include, yes, aerobic fitness and local muscular endurance, mm -hmm. but also uh, power and uh, ability to do basically tasks that are more similar to what you would see on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. And there is a book from the National Strength and Conditioning Association um, that's written by a colleague of mine named Nate Palin. And, and that book is basically how to prepare for the ACFT, the Army Combat Fitness Test. So if you are a young person aspiring to join the military, I would say that that, that particular book would be a very good resource for you. It's well vetted, right? The, the National Strength and Conditioning Association is a very well-respected organization nationally and internationally in the strength and conditioning uh, realm. So that, that book, I would say, could be a very good way for you to start. Um, and th that's so th that's what I would say, you know, there's some pre buds workouts online. And then that book uh, by Nate Palin would be, again, a really good place to start. Is there anything mentally that can prepare? I know, you know, people for one of the biggest things and I've known from youth sports, being a coach and being on the board and and seeing uh, different uh, kids interact and stuff. There's a big thing with mental health you know, anxiety, stress, yeah. yeah. which if you're going to fight in combat, I would imagine that there'd be, a, you know, the utmost level of stress and anxiety. Is there something, you know, I guess every individual is different, but is there something you can do to prepare mentally for what you're going to, you know? Understand? Yes. Um, so th there are a couple things. Uh, the first thing I'll say is that there, there's a ton of evidence that clearly demonstrates a strong association between physical activity and mental health, mm -hmm. both acutely, meaning right away, and then chronically over time. So if you're feeling sad or depressed or anxious, we know that by being just a little bit physically active, I know that for me, I kind of need a, some, sometimes I need a workout. Like I, like for me, sometimes just going and 
picking up and putting down heavy stuff. I don't know if we're allowed to curse on this on this uh, <laughs> podcast or not, so I'll just say <laughs> stuff. But, but but picking up and putting down heavy stuff really helps me clear my head, and it just puts me in a better mood. And then there are other days where sometimes just going for a walk. Or mm -hmm. Frank, you know, where I come, where you and I come from is going for a walk. But either way, <laughs> uh, no matter what you're doing, having a cup of coffee and going for a walk can sometimes <laughs> clear the head pretty good. Um, so so it's very important for, for people to know that, again, both acutely, like immediately following a, a, a bout of physical activity, again, whether that's a high intensity activity like, like a formal workout or just literally going for a 10 or 15 minute walk, it yeah. can dramatically shift our mood and change our feelings of anxiety and depression and even post-traumatic stress. Um, and then also chronically over time by doing it regularly, you can see a reduction in some of those mental health outcomes. Um, the other thing that's been well shown in the evidence is something called mind, mindful-based stress reduction, MBSR. Mm -hmm. So doing some mindful activities, um, you know, meditation, for example, and there's some wonderful apps that are out there and tools that are out there to do some some mindfulness work where you're just you're really just taking time to slow things down we spend so much time in our head mm. that we often don't really think about what's going on in our bodies and frankly they are connected there's this little thing called the neck uh that connects the head to the <laughs> rest of the body and um and i'll, I'll just share a personal story for a minute um so I, when I was 11, about 11 years old, um, I broke my back. Uh, mm. I had a very severe back injury because uh, I, I thought it was going to be a good idea in, in my 11-year-old mind to try to set the world record for stair jumping. I was going to try to jump down as many <laughs> stairs as I could. But Rob, I think you know this story. Yes, I know. Um, so I grew up, I grew up in, a, in, a, in a household where both parents were at work. I was the youngest of five kids. And uh, so my parents were off at work and my middle brother, was sort of the, the caretaker uh, of, of my sister and I, because my oldest siblings were already out of the house. And it was, it was Valentine's Day of 1983. I was 11 years old. And I was perched at the top of the staircase. Um, and I decided I was going to try to jump down 17 stairs. Oh <laughs> right? Because when you're 11 years old, you're like, nah, this is a good idea. Somebody, <laughs> called, you know, somebody called the Guinness Book of World Records and let them know I'm about to set the world record. I didn't know what the world record was, but I figured 17 was probably close. <laughs> so to make a long story short, I, I, I initiated the jump and my hand slipped and I, and I fell on my back. And uh, most, most immediately what I felt was three cracked ribs. If you've ever broken ribs, you know, how, how, um, mm -hmm. painful. how painful that can be. Um, so I was treated initially for three cracked ribs, but then a few months later, I started developing pretty severe low back pain. And they identified that I had fractured four vertebrae in my lumbar spine. I had herniated two discs and I had something called a spondylolisthesis, which is a slippage of one vertebra vertebra body in front of another. Uh, which can impinge on the, on the spinal cord. So um, basically, I, I was taken out of youth sport. I was a very active young kid. I was put in a back brace. I was taken out of youth sport. And, uh, and the less I moved, the more pain I had. And so after a year and a half of being in a back brace and getting worse and worse and worse, I went to my dad, who was actually a neurologist. And I was like, Dad, I, I, like, I'm feeling worse, not better. Long story short, I ended up in physical therapy and I got better, you know, by strengthening the musculature around the affected structure, mm -hmm. I was able to feel better. What happened over the course of my life, uh, subsequent to that, I got back into sports and I was, I was able to even play some collision sports through, through, uh, through high school. Um, but what happened was when I was in times of high stress, so uh, I was saying to you earlier, Frank, my first job after I graduated from college, I was an insurance broker in Midtown Manhattan and then out on Long Island, which is like a really high stress and sedentary job. And my father had just passed away. So I was under a lot of stress and I, I had episodes of low back pain that were so severe, like muscle spasms that I landed in the hospital several times, like incapacitating, un, unable to move. And they put me on opioids and they, you know, it was bad, it was really bad. And thankfully I never got addicted to any opioids. But I had these episodes uh, of, low, of back pain, back spasms over the course of my life that would come and go. And generally, the more physically fit I was, 
the less frequent and less severe those things became. Mm. But then in my early 40s, I started developing chronic and progressive neurological back pain. Some, some people may know, know or heard of sciatica, right? So there's, there's sure. this nerve, right? That comes out of your lumbar spine mm. called the sciatic nerve. Mm. And that was basically being impinged, right? I, I had so much arthritis now in that affected area that that nerve was being constantly impinged. Wow. And so I started developing symptoms down my hamstring, into my calf. I started to have foot drop, uh, where if I stood for more than about 15 or 20 minutes, I couldn't even lift my foot. I was starting to trip. Mm. My kids were young. It's, it scared the bejesus out of me because I thought, oh my gosh, like, is this kind of like the, end, the beginning of the end in terms of my physical activity and fitness? And I exhausted every physical option under the sun, physical therapy, acupuncture. I mean, I'm an exercise physiologist. So, you know, I, I, I just went to everything physical that I, that I could think of. Uh, I stopped lifting weights. I was like, I'm just going to do a summer of yoga and nothing worked. Mm. And I went to consult finally three neuro neurosurgeons because I didn't think I could take the pain anymore. I mean, I, I was, you know, on a one to 10 scale of pain. I was at like a five to a six every minute of every day. And for those who have ever experienced chronic pain, it makes you pretty angry, pretty grumpy. And, and I was a tough person to be around. Mm. And um, so I consulted three different neurosurgeons and they all told me the same thing. Uh, they basically said, based upon your history, if we go in and do surgery, there's a likelihood we're gonna destabilize that entire area and so you're looking at a, at, at, at a four joint segment fusion, which is going to take six to 12 months of recovery, mm -hmm. and it may not even work. Like there's a 70% chance it's going to work and a 30% chance it's either not going to work or it's going to make it worse. So they all said, if you can live with the pain, live with the pain. Well, I, I, wanted, the, I wanted the easy fix. Like I, I, want, sir, I, want, I want this pain to stop now because I, I had had it. But they, I looked at the odds and the odds weren't very good. <clears throat> excuse me. And I have a brother who's a meditation teacher. And he said, Dan, have you, have you tried meditating? And I said, well, I've done yoga. And he said, no, have you ever like just sat still <laughs> and just done some breathing and meditation? And I was like, no, I can't do that. Like my brain's too uh, on overdrive. He goes like, well, that's kind of the whole point. Um, so in, in essence, I started doing some meditation. And what I learned was that I was spending so much time in my head that I was not aware of what was going on in my body. I was not aware that that sciatic nerve was constantly sending this signal into my butt and down my leg and so on and so forth. And when I started meditating, I realized, I know it sounds kind of crazy, Frank and Rob, but yeah. I could actually tell those muscles to just relax. Hmm. When I had an opportunity to stop thinking about the future and the past and worrying about this and that and the other thing, I could just be in my body, knowing what's happening, breathing and relaxing. And within two months, I was pain-free. I, I believe that 100% from bodybuilding and the overload on my back, doing six, 700 pound squats, my spine was compressed. I was chronically in pain, sitting in the car. You know, you got to jump out of the car. You got to stretch out your leg. Uh, you know, I was not big on painkillers, but it was debilitating. And a friend of mine who was in the WWE at the time got thrown out of the ring and she hurt her back and she started doing uh, hot yoga. So she's like, she said to me, she's like, you know, you should try hot yoga. And I was like, okay. And then someone, you have people who will say it's a phantom pain. There was a book by Dr. Sarney. I don't know if you saw that, that it's all mental and whatever. So I'm like, okay, whatever. Went into hot yoga. I was the worst person in the class. And after 10 years, I was in the middle of pack. You know, I made, I made my way in the middle of pack. But it worked. The meditative states, a moving meditation, 26 postures, the heat. However, it worked phenomenally. Never had any back, not good, any back pain. But to get to that point, like you exhausted every option before you did meditation. I did the same until I, a lot of people... There's a stigma about meditation that, you know, um, you're not mentally set. There's, you know, you know, the stigmatization, you know, people, oh, it's not for me. It's for yogis and it's for that. But there's so many different uh, meditations, transcendental meditation, the Calm app, just sitting still for a certain amount of time will help. And I think that's a huge component to any program that's missing right now. 
when you can sit there and decompress, it's extremely important. I would think that's, you know, that the military would, you know, focus on that, especially they with, are. Yeah, especially with all the things going on around. Cause that's you can have the best program in the world. I can give you the best program, but if you're not mentally there to do it, it's not gonna be worth the paper it's written on. So that's what I'm saying. Is there an initiative for like more meditation? 100% Frank. So, you know, in, in the fancy word for it is called down regulation. Oh, okay. Um, so, you know, we, we spend so much time in high stress, especially if you're military, especially if you're a special operator in, in high stress fight or flight situations. Mm -hmm. So down regulation is the opportunity to, again, let everything kind of relax and rejuvenate. And <clears throat> What's happening in the military now is the integration of something called the high performance model, which which was a, adopted from professional athletics. Uh -oh. So in professional athletics, you saw that around the elite athletes, there was an entire team of professionals, a physical therapist, athletic trainer, strength coach, and a, a, be, a you know mental cognitive coach, a behavioral yeah. therapist, maybe an acupuncturist, a, a chiropractor to help these sport athletes be at their very best, perform at the highest level possible for as long as possible. Then the special operation forces started adopting this high performance model very successfully uh, over the last couple of decades. And now with what I was talking about earlier, total force fitness and the army's holistic health and fitness or H2F, what they're doing is trying to deploy now this, this high performance model across the entire conventional force, meaning the non-special operators. Mm. So that for ideally as, as H2F gets rolled out and it's really just in, in its earliest stages of implementation, but that every soldier is gonna have access to a, a physical therapist, athletic trainer, strength coach, behavioral therapist, cognitive performance coach, oh. and so on. So yes, that is happening. And yes, yoga, is becoming a part of military physical training where we can at least get mind body happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. And we are starting to destigmatize some of these, uh, you know, mental health issues that said, there is still a long way to go. I mean, you are still, it still is very much a culture of sort of choke it down, push it down, no, 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 no. be strong. Um, keep it to yourself. <laughs> yeah. Keep it to yourself, you know, but, the culture is starting to change and, and just imagine if, when, and not just if, but when, when the military leads the way in demonstrating that to, to say that you're anxious or that you're, you know, you're, you're, you're sad, or maybe you've had a few too many drinks or you're having trouble at home. And it's, it's not actually seen as a weakness, but it's a strength to bring that forward. And you've got, again, an environment that's supportive of that and can help you heal from that. Well, when we look at our war fighters nationally and say they're willing and able to do that, well, then hopefully the rest of our country is going to get on board. Um, so yes, the military is, is, is working on that and creating that culture shift. The VA Mm -hmm. is doing a great job in that area. And a lot of great research is coming out of the VA on the benefits of uh, mindfulness work, uh, but especially with people who've experienced a lot of trauma. I mean, a lot of trauma, maybe even before they even got into the uniform, they experienced trauma. And then once they got in and were forward deployed and saw the things that they saw in war, they had a lot, there's a lot of trauma. And there, there's some great Again, VA is leading the way. There's a bunch of veteran service organizations leading the way. And I think I want to point out that we, we should not be thinking of our veterans as broken people. No. These are incredibly accomplished individuals with tremendous skill sets. And they need to be not only honored, but employed and deployed as leaders in our communities. Uh, who can inspire others, maybe, maybe to join the military, maybe not, to, but, but to be a productive member of our society. And that if you are struggling physically, mentally, spiritually, there are support systems out there. And when you take advantage of them, you get to be the best version of yourself. 
And there are many veterans out there doing that every day. I was just with a, a group of them at a place called the University of Health and Performance. They're doing it. The VA is providing a lot of these services through their quote unquote whole health initiative. So the programs are out there. And the more we get service members and veterans utilizing them, then the greater we're going to become. And then that's sort of the purpose of this show, you know, that we start getting more and more veterans to talk about their experiences, but people like yourself who come on and talk about the resources out there. You know, when you were mentioning the, the university, Matt Hesse, we just covered him in Muscle and Fitness, but he's going to be a future guest. And actually, Frank was a consultant with Frank, uh, with uh, Matt many years ago. And uh, yeah. one of the terms that we um, that the Army is using now is warrior athlete. And uh, I was at a conference recently where one of the uh, four-star generals talked about the mission of the military is everyone can't forget we are here to fight and defend our nation. And so whatever it takes to prepare these athletes, warriors, that's what he called them, mm -hmm. athlete warriors, this is what we have to do. So your analogy of a, of a sports or a superstar athlete is very, very, uh, very, very fitting for a military person. And you and I have talked back and forth about, you know, who wouldn't want to join America's greatest team? the military, the, the, this great fighting force that takes care of your healthcare needs, that looks after your family, that you have all these different mentors and resources that when you have issues, they are the experts and they will be willing to help you. So, you know, for those of us who have served and those like you and Frank who support those who serve, we need to speak more about the uh, opportunities that serving on America's greatest team, the U.S. Armed Forces provides to you. You know, what? when I was a kid, remember when you had the G.I. Joe? G.I. Joe was big. He was ripped. Yeah. <laughs> he was shredded. When you think about the Navy SEALs, you think about an amazing workout. They're upper level, top of the food chain. Somehow, some way, it's just, you know, there hasn't been anything new. You know what I mean? Like, it's good to hear that there's all these new programs and such. Going back to Matt Hesse, um, I had the honor of working with a lot of the people in fit ops who were competing. And to go back to what you were saying before, Dan, when they had a structured program uh, to follow, it helped them so much mentally. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, wow, look at my dog. Hey, <laughs> it helped them so much mentally because they had a structured program to follow. You know what I mean? They know how to eat at this time. They had to drink uh, to, to, to train and stuff. So mentally they were getting, when you get in better shape physically, mentally you're better. So what do you think about that? So many people don't follow a structured program. How do you like, you know, how do you put together something for the bases and stuff where people are on a structured program, you know, like they could all follow a program that, you know, could, to, to could benefit obviously their performance in the military. But I, that's where I think there's a big, a big miss. You know what I mean? The yeah. So that's a, the great, the role great of question, it, right? you know? Yeah. yeah. So, um, a couple ways to go here. One one is that um, from just a from from an individual's perspective, in terms of hey hey you know you're listening to this podcast, you want to know what what you can do to to become more physically active, physically fit. Mm -hmm. um, and and Rob, you and I have talked about this before too. That <clears throat> I think it's important that people understand the difference between sort of exercise and mm -hmm. physical activity because yeah. they they're similar, but different. So physical activity is this very broad umbrella that can include exercise. Exercise is typically structured and planned and like you were just talking about, right? Yeah. Um, and it can include taking your kids or your dog for a walk or your dog for a walk or going for a cup of coffee. Um, it can include gardening. It can include just taking the steps instead of the elevator. And we have federal physical activity guidelines. And in those guidelines, it's the suggestion based on decades of really good science is that you get 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity physical activity, no matter what that is. And it can be in, in, in bouts of one minute, two minutes, 30 seconds, five minutes, 10 minutes, but accumulate 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity aerobic physical activity. or 75 minutes per week of vigorous intensity aerobic physical activity, along with some muscle strengthening exercises. So that's the basic federal physical activity guideline. 
And roughly 70% 70, 70 of American adults, by the way, do not meet that guideline. Mm. Okay, so just as a country, we're, we're failing there. Wow. Uh, Rob, yeah, did you want you to tell them? Um, can you tell them what your term exercise snacks are? Yes. <laughs> so I, I, you know, on top of working out regularly, which I do try to do, um, I also engage in, in what I call physical activity snacks. So a physical activity snack is, you know, it might be, it might be a little, really small snack. So right now I'm sitting at my desk. When we finish this podcast, uh, I, I, I do have another meeting coming up. But in between, I'm probably going to do about 50 jumping jacks. I'm going to do maybe some reverse lunges to stretch out my hip flexors. And I'm going to do something to get my shoulders moving. That's a physical, it's going to take me probably a minute and a half, two minutes. And that's a physical activity snack. Mm. Sometimes it's a 10 minute walk. Sometimes it's, you know, just taking the stairs instead of the elevator. So finding ways, just like you would with a meal, right? Or, or, or over the course of a day, you're going to have maybe three structured meals, but maybe you're going to have three or four snacks throughout the day. So any time that we can find time for a physical activity snack, we should do that. And that again, over the course of a week, it's not that hard actually to accumulate 150 minutes of snacks. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have a change of clothes. You don't have to have a structured workout program, which we'll get to that in a sec, Frank. Yeah. Um, so it's just, I think it's important for people to understand that they don't even necessarily need to engage in a structured exercise program to get the benefits of physical activity, which are prevention of and treatment of diabetes, heart disease, stroke, cancers, and all the mental health issues or many of the mental health issues that we talked about, stress, anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress. So just by being physically active and not even necessarily ever setting foot in a gym, you can get all these benefits. Now, if you want to uh, uh, set a foot in a gym and you want to train for a tactical uh, job. So Rob, you, you talked about the term, um, I think it was warrior athlete or soldier athlete. Right. And it's interesting, you know, there, there's some, there is some dialogue back and forth in the tactical population, meaning the professions that include war fighting, but also crime fighting and firefighting that, you know, some soldiers and, and, and airmen and Marines and so on, they don't necessarily want to, or firefighters or cops, they don't necessarily want to think of themselves as athletes. And so we're having this internal dialogue in this, this new sub-discipline that's called tactical strengthening and conditioning coaching. So while I was at the Citadel, for example, uh, we developed the, the nation's first degree programs, undergraduate and graduate degree, degree programs in the subspecialty of tactical strength and conditioning coaching, meaning you were going to be a strength and conditioning coach with a unique understanding of the physiological and even mental and cognitive demands of the tactical professional and could then be able to develop a program to help them meet those physiological, cognitive, behavioral demands. Hmm. So there's this whole new, just within the last probably five years, Subdiscipline of or profession called tactical strength and conditioning coaching. Um, and within that discipline, to your point, Frank, um, you can you can have somebody, so again, who, who designs and they are doing this. So H2F, Army's Holistic Health and Fitness Program, is they they are hiring, I mean, big time hiring lots of tactical strength and conditioning coaches, mm. um, not necessarily green tutors, so individuals wearing the uniform but they're looking for contractors and civilians who can fill these roles. So if you're somebody who's out there who has uh, experience and credentials in the, in the area of strength and conditioning, oh, and by the way, you happen to have been a service member or you understand even a little bit about the culture of the military, there's a job out there for you right now. I mean, they are hiring um, and, they, and they need individuals who can, at least from a scientific, you know, programmatic perspective, understand the needs of the tactical uh, athlete or tactical professional, design a program that is scientifically valid, and then deliver it and help help these uh, war fighters, crime fighters, firefighters do their jobs better. I mean, just think about it. if we think about cops for a minute, um, I don't want to get too controversial here, but if you think about the need to draw your weapon, the, the need to draw your weapon may be higher if you lack confidence and ability in your physical skills, maybe even some of your hand-to-hand -hand combat skills. Yeah. So I think, you know, you talked about working with, with mixed martial arts. 
you know, what a great way to train, frankly, if you want to get ready for the military, if you're, if you're doing any kind of mixed martial arts right now, you're, you're going to be very well set up to do something like pass the army combat fitness test. So you may not need to do any additional training. Uh, but in answer to your original question, Frank, there are actual professionals now who know how to design programs specifically to meet the physiological demands of the tactical profession. It's so funny. You just, I just remembered a story you just said about the police department. My father was a New York City uh, narcotics detective. And I remember sitting on the front stoop. Remember the stoop? Yeah, I remember <laughs> the stoop. And he was watering the, you know, the five by five patch of grass that we had. And there was a very, very obese police officer chasing uh, a drug dealer down the block. And my father, before I was sitting next to him, before I knew it, dropped the hose. My father, about 50 yards, tackled him, was sitting on top of him, had him, you know, down on the ground. And this cop, <laughs> I thought he was going to have a heart attack <laughs> behind him and everything else. And I was like, wow, if I was a police officer, I, I hope to God that my father was my partner and that guy wasn't. So I could just imagine, you know, in the military, you, you know, it's life or death. Um, you know, situations, uh, so police department, all these things that you'd want to get in the best shape of your, of your life and go. And I a hundred percent agree with you when, after my divorce, I started walking and I, I was walking probably an hour a day, every day. And I dropped like 12 pounds. I didn't do anything different. I didn't eat differently. I was training the same with weights, but just adding that additional minutes it made a huge impact. And people are like, what are you doing? Two hours of H-I-T-T uh, cardio? I'm like, no, I was walking <laughs> in the park. It was probably 3.0. But yeah, I mean, people don't, people think it has to be intense. It has to be hard. It really doesn't. It, it, no, it doesn't. It doesn't necessarily have to be that, that intense. And, and I'll just say very quickly too, that um, just after high school and through college and my early even professional career, um, I spent eight years as a volunteer firefighter yeah. And, and, and that was the first time that I was ever working out for somebody else's benefit. Like, so as a firefighter, right, you put your air pack on, you're going to try to, the idea is to make it last as long as possible when you're going inside a burning building. And you don't want to be the guy that eight minutes in, his alarm's going off because he's, he's breathed his way through his air tank and he's got to get out of the building. So I was working out to try to ma maximize how long I, I could let that bottle go on my back and not be the weakest link in the chain for a team that was going in to attack a fire. Hmm. So very much the same way, right? And, and, and you know, then that's where sports and the military are similar and different. You're counting on your teammates in sports to win the game. And in the military and, and law enforcement and fire, you're counting on your teammates maybe to save your life or right. save somebody else's. And, and Dan, as we're starting to wrap up with our time here, um, you had shared some research with me about Southern states, which are known for their higher rates of obesity and physical inactivity, but also happen to be the most fertile ground for recruits. So what do you think is happening in these Southern states that, you know, they're having people who are not physically fit, but they have such pride that they, they serve our country in greater numbers than the rest of the nation? Um, yeah, good question, Rob. So yes, I, in some of the research that I did with the US Army, we looked at the physical fitness levels and MSKI, musculoskeletal injury rates, of recruits, Army recruits who entered basic training over a three year period. So, this is over 300,000 recruits from all over the country. And we had the zip code that they were recruited from. So, we could tell which state they were coming from. And we looked to see if there were differences in the physical fitness levels and/or the injury rates of soldiers from different states with the hypothesis, my hypothesis being that soldiers coming out of the South, even though it was the most fertile ground, were going to be the least physically fit and most likely to get injured because of what I knew about public health outcomes, which were that, the, you know, the prevalence of diabetes and heart disease and right. The South is called the stroke belt. I mean, I was living in South Carolina, right in the middle of the stroke belt. And that hypothesis held we identified a cluster of 10 Southern states that were, that were producing recruits who were significantly less physically fit and more likely to sustain an MSKI during basic training. So, and we were about to publish a follow-up study to that, Rob, 
where we're, we're, we just looked at one year of basic training to look at the cost, the direct medical cost of, of MSKIs in different states. Um, basically, yeah, I guess I'll share the results here. Breaking news, Frank, breaking news, you know, <laughs> mus muscle and fitness. Again, it was a cluster of Southern states that are disproportionately costing the DOD the most money for two reasons. One, it's the most fertile ground. Mm -hmm. And two, so you got more people coming from that area and the, they're less fit and more likely to get injured. So when you couple those two factors together, mm -hmm. you could easily, and we, we do in the research study, make the argument that if you're going to intervene anywhere, intervene in the South. And what I mean by intervene, I mean policy systems and environmental changes, like we were talking about in the very first part of this, this uh, discussion. We're creatures of our environment. So our schools, our communities, our places of worship, our towns, how we develop uh, uh, our systems of transportation, those need to support active lifestyles and access to healthy, good, nutritious food. Mm -hmm. and, and that comes through policy change, ultimately. It's really a public health model where we, and again, the military's really trying to do their part but as, as I said in, in a congressional briefing that I gave, we are basically giving the military a bunch of lemon, lemons and asking them to make lemonade out of those lemons. Yeah. And so in Southern states in particular, it's time to start making lemonade, <laughs> really, quite frankly. <laughs> and, and Dan, do you think that COVID had played a, a significant role in this? Like, has it just brought more attention to that those who probably were in better condition if they caught COVID were able to survive it? while those who were had a you know a pre-existing condition may not have been able to survive it or they got it worse to where they're still you know ravaged with the effects of it like covid fog or just not feeling themselves again yes Co covid it, it, covid identified the weakness basically right so you know it, it's it's uh one of my favorite comedians bill burr talks about sometimes maybe it's time to thin the herd a little bit um you know you know, net, you know, if you look historically, you know, again, over long history, the, the weakest don't survive. And the reality is COVID did disproportionately adversely affect individuals who suffer from chronic diseases that are largely preventable. Diabetes, heart disease, stroke, uh, obesity, these are preventable conditions. And we need to set the conditions, as the military would say. We need to provide the environments that allow becoming and staying more physically active and eating more healthfully easier choices to make. I'm not saying we're going to force you to do it, right? We've known for a long time that smoking is really bad for you. So we instituted, and, and, and bad for other people, quite, quite, quite frankly. So we instituted laws that said, well, A, we're going to put a tax on cigarettes, so they're, they're, they're more expensive, harder to buy. We're going to tell you where you can and can't smoke. Can you still smoke? Yes. Do people still smoke? Yes. Has the number of people who smoke gone down precipitously? Yes. Has death from lung cancer gone down precipitously? Yes. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about a nanny state here, but what we're talking about is nudging people in the right direction by creating some supportive social, physical built environments for them. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah, for sure. You know, I never, I knock wood, I've never gotten COVID yet. <laughs> I've been around numerous people have had it. We were at, you know, shows and what have you. And I, I'm curious to see why certain people do get it and certain people don't, but I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm with you, Frank. Uh, we've been pretty fortunate too. We've been around people who have, but I think a lot of it has to do with that we we stayed in the gym. We kept working out. Like my wife ensured we worked out as a family. We rode our bikes more. We have uh, you know exercise equipment here, and we we played a a safe game. We tried to stay out of environment, but we yeah. kept moving. And it was just um, it was nice to see so many people in the neighborhood exercise more as well. So I think those who who kept moving maybe they fared better than those who did not, but. Dan, is there any kind of tips that um, you would like to leave us with, like three to five tips? Because, you know, it's not all gloom and doom. And you and I often go back and forth and saying that there are some things that we can start doing. And you're often a, an inspiration and a cheerleader online. Like I was at this conference recently and we all joked about how many steps does it take before you know somebody who knows Dan Bornstein? 
you know, you're like uh, so connected in this community. So first of all, thank you for sharing your knowledge, your education, your, your experiences, your network with so many, but um, maybe share some tips that you can provide or even some links that yeah. Frank can put up in the closing of this so that we can keep people inspired. And Dan, you're not done with us. You will be back. Absolutely. Well, th thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um, you know, I think in terms of tips, I think one, one of the greatest ones is, is the physical activity snacking that we talked about earlier. Um, even if you do, cause, and, and Frank, you even alluded to this, even if you are hitting the gym five mm. days a week, six days a week for an hour, there are 23 other <laughs> hours in your day. Yeah. So don't think like, oh, I, I knocked it out of the park this morning, you know, at the gym. Well, awesome, right? I mean, that really is awesome. Yeah. And find every opportunity you can to be physically active. Move. <laughs> move. Move your body. Move. Um, the, the CDC has, has, so here's a link, Active People Healthy Nation. So if you want to check out something, that's a, a, a movement, so to speak. Check out the CDC's Active People Healthy Nation. Um, chances are, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably already inherently interested in fitness. Mm -hmm. So more than a piece of advice, it's, it's a call to action. I would, I, would, I would implore you to be a champion for, again, not necessarily exercise, because some people do have an aversion to exercise, um, but to be a champion for physical activity in your community, mm -hmm. lead people on a walk. You know, maybe you're a CEO. Instead of sitting around the boardroom, how about going for a walking meeting? Mm -hmm. uh, if you're if you have kids in school, be a champion for high quality and quantity physical education in schools. Make sure there there are ways. Try to work with your local uh, municipalities to ensure there's access to youth sport programs, particularly in areas that are socioeconomically maybe depressed. And another link, I would check out our national youth sport strategy. Our national youth sport strategy talks about ways in which we can get more kids involved in youth sport, mm. which is critically important. So be a champion, maybe even run for local office, You know, get on your school board, or be a, you know, a, a select board member of, of your town or community and make sure that your parks are safe and there are safe ways to get to and from the grocery store if you live within a mile so that you can walk it or bike it. You know, all these things that seem so, maybe so small, when we have individual champions or spark plugs out there, we get the engine going. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need. We need people out there who are not just an engine for themselves, but they're an engine for their country, not just to improve the health of their country, but as we're talking about the safety and security of our country. So you don't have to wear a uniform to serve your country. You can serve your country by being a champion for physical activity in the communities in which you live and work and play and pray. That's great advice. That's awesome. So uh, I'm gonna leave you with this quote from General Mark Hartling. He says the military has experienced increasing difficulty in recruiting soldiers as a result of physical inactivity, obesity, and malnutrition among our nation's youth. Mm -hmm. Not addressing these issues now will impact our future national security. So as you were talking about those engines, I see you as an engine and I see Frank as an engine because while you didn't wear the, the, the nation's cloth, you're serving our nation in a different way by providing information, resources, and inspiration for millions of people out there who may look to you as that source of uh, North Star. So thank you both for what you do. Dan, I'm sure that there'll, there'll be more groundbreaking research you'll be sending our way. So Frank and I look forward to uh, sharing that information with our audience. And uh, thanks to Frank's efforts here, we're getting close to a million people this month that have seen our interviews. So uh, thanks to all those who are following us. Again, Dan, thank you. We'll see you again. Frank, thank for all you're doing and uh, have a great day, everybody. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate yeah, thank you both. Thank you both. Be well. Bye now.